Yeah, I have a PhD in philosophy from the University of Buffalo in New York. Um, my um, research focus sometimes is on, is on oppression or in this area called phenomenology, the study of consciousness. Um, I'm an associate professor of philosophy at St. Mary's, as well as one of the co-directors of the new first year experience. One of the things that developmental psychology came to mind and when I was thinking about this, um, the idea of object permanence and represent, representational thought, uh, Piaget had done the cognitive development stages. He had discovered that children, when they reach a certain age, um, they realize that when a mom hides a toy behind her back, that is still there. But before they reach that age, um, some would refer to as maybe a critical period. Um, before the child reaches that age, when the mom puts the object behind her back, the child thinks the object has disappeared from all reality and existence. And they call it object permanence when the child finally realizes that, no, it's not actually gone. It's still there because the mind can map, I guess, a image of it, you know, even though they can't see it. You know, I have a background in phenomenology, which is, again, the study of, of consciousness or the structures of consciousness. This is one of those things that was really fascinating to watch my own kids go through those stages of development. One way we might think about this is to think about it as the ability to maintain a representation to borrow the language you, you just used um, or an understanding of an object in its absence. And that seems to be one of those critical pieces at any rate, even if it's not the whole thing of whatever it means when we say that we have object permanence, whether we're talking about non-human animals, some you know, social mammals can do this too, or humans, is that we learn the, the absence of the thing to our senses is not mean the absence of it from the world as such. Um, but you know, then there's other stuff about children too, like the, the law of reversibility. Some children at a certain age don't realize that things can be reversed. They think that it's permanent. Mm -hmm. um, some of them don't realize that when you have a glass this tall, and this wide is the same liquid in, when you pour it from the tall glass into the short glass, but the child thinks that the amount of the liquid has changed. A lot of it is trying to figure out how our body interacts with the world um, so that the embodied self has a lot to do with this. Just to just, just to amplify kind of what you were saying, Steele, is because a lot of those other conditions you're talking about are cases where someone's body has a different state of affairs. You know, it's not a sighted body or it's a body that has some other cognitive defect that's you know built into their um, neurology or something like this. And that affects that interaction between body and world in ways that create a different pattern of representations. Because you know, we perceive mm -hmm. reality through our five senses. And, but, and yet, you know, people have different perceptions of reality and almost live in their own worlds. Yeah, it just makes you wonder what, what reality really is. And, and I know Rene Descartes, a philosopher, talked about that. He doubted reality, so. At the very least, what he was trying to do is figure out how, what he could or could not know about reality. Um, and, and know here being a very technical term in, in philosophical jargon. Um, so every, in everyday usage, we, we use the word know to be like, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is right or something like this, right? It doesn't have much more weight than that. But when a philosopher uses the word know, what it, what it sometimes means is something like, I, I've justified true belief, but as a good reasons to, for believing something that I happen to believe, and it's also true. And for Descartes, um, you know, that's part of what he really worried about is how can I know if anything is really true about the world out there? And he had an understanding of it as being out there. But he's like, I'm going to just, for once in my life, kind of submit everything to radical doubt and put it, on a, put it all in brackets and put it on a shelf. And I don't get it back unless I have strong justification. So the, no, he's putting the accent on that. I have good reasons, reliable reasons for thinking something is true. And unless I can pass that hurdle, uh, you know, I can't make a judgment that something is real or not is kind of where he starts. So he um, talked about dreams and, and how do we know if we're not still in a dream? So, <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, so as he walks through this process of radical doubt, what he's doing is he's kind of clustering different kinds of justification he might have. So the first thing he does is he assaults the senses. He says, you know, my senses can sometimes be deceived. And he goes, okay, so then I have good reason to, I have a reason to doubt the senses so I can take all sensory stuff. But along the way he goes, well, that might be too hasty, right? And this is a step that I think a lot of people miss when they, they read it. Maybe the senses are only deceived under certain conditions or constraints. But he says, and this is why he thinks about dreams. So, you know, I can't, I can experience a dream in which I don't know if I'm awake or not. And I can experience a dream where I think I've woken up, but it turns out I'm still dreaming. And so there's a more systematic way in which all of that sensory information could possibly be 
misguided. Um, and there's, there's yet other thought experiments he raises as well, but just for tr- turning to the dream argument, like that's the big key. And it's that principle there that, that really is driving that argument, which is there doesn't appear to be any principled basis on which we can distinguish between dreaming states and waking states. There's just, because they can always be, the mind can always kind of be duped in that regard or yeah. can be misguided or mistaken. Because we never know when we're dreaming, when we're in a dream, I, I think is what we're getting at here. But what do you think right. I was about uh, dreams within dreams, not knowing if we're ever really awake? That's pretty cool because I know you still have experimented a little bit more with, you know, trying to control your dreams. Lucid dreaming. Uh, yeah, lucid dreaming. I can tell so, you right now, I've had some really realistic ones and they seem real. Even when I'm in them, it's insane how detailed. Yeah, and those are one of those phenomena that Descartes is clearly aware of. He, he understands yeah. that this is something that happens to some people. And even if it doesn't happen to everyone, it's like, mm, wow, how do I know that that's, I'm not one of those candidates, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can be fooled in thinking something else is the actual reality when, you know, maybe it's not. We continue to spend more time in the screens and then later into virtual reality, then which reality is is the one we consider to be real, the one where we spend the most time or, you know, the one where we actually live in. Part of what Descartes helped us do is to crystallize the question clearly enough in a way where we can kind of understand a little better or we can, we can figure out a little better what aren't good answers from what are good answers. This is one of the ways that philosophy makes progress is sometimes we, we just happen to have a breakthrough where, you know, we can throw a whole bunch of stuff out now or new things come back into play. I think a lot of what it is going to come down to is what do we think is a world or what do we think we mean when we use the term reality? Are we referring to something that's objectively accessible to anybody in principle or that does it have other constraints on it? Your meaning changes our perceptions of reality. And I know that I was studying psychology yeah. and cognitive appraisals, uh, cognitive distortions, cognitive mm-hmm. behavioral therapy is all about you know, looking at people's dysfunctional perceptions of reality, you know, like I might see, uh, like one brother could see the father as a positive role model, the other brother might see him as a hateful monster. Yeah, again, if we think that what we mean by referring to reality test meanings, then, you know, it kind of doesn't matter that we're talking about the object of collection of stuff. So those virtual worlds can actually be kind of more real to us in one way of thinking about what it means to call something real than not. Now, if we mean by real, it's got to be mind independently true, right? It's just out there, even if we're not here, uh, you know, then we're to- it seems like maybe what we're talking about are two different things sometimes is one is the set of meanings, right, through which we filter our perceptions and our judgments. And one is, you know, the stuff, uh, but we can't know the stuff independent of our judgments and our perceptions of them. So we're sort of limited there in terms of how much and how we go about gathering our knowledge. So um, do you think reality is an illusion or is there some objective, I don't know, uh, matter, truth, whatever you want to call it to it? Um, so that's, that's a very good question. I, I, I don't honestly don't, I don't know. Cause I think it's going to come down to what we, what we have to say. I think. Yeah.